I think we all feel pretty lucky in paediatric EDs in the UK because compared to our adult counterparts over the course of the pandemic, we haven't seen the same volume or severity and had the same flow issues. But with the upcoming respiratory surge, it's likely we are going to see flow issues in PTD. With our EDs getting filled up, our wards getting filled up and our PICUs getting filled up, it's really important that we plan. We're going to focus on three key areas. Departmental flow, staff wellbeing and morale, and finally, I'm going to look at a common clinical conundrum we're going to face, which is the issue of RSV versus COVID. This video is not going to give you all the answers, unfortunately, but I'm going to raise some of the key issues that we should all be discussing in our own departments. When we think about flow and how to manage and plan for it, we need to split it into four key areas. Inflow, acuity, outflow and crowding. Let's take a look at each of these in turn. Inflow. We are not unfamiliar with planning how to manage flow and inflow in PTDs. Let's think about a couple of examples where we might have to do this. Let's say we've got a BMX racing championship just up the road from our department and we know that there's going to be 1,500 teenagers there all cycling on their BMX bikes. We can reasonably plan that there's going to be a number of orthopaedic injuries and we might get things set in our department for that. Some things we might do here would be make sure we've got good analgesia plan and analgesia ready. We might want to get more plastering kits ready. We're going to give the radiographers and radiology a heads up because we're going to be sending more patients for imaging than normal and orthopedics could get a heads up as well because it's likely they're going to be doing more manipulations. Let's say we've got a meningococcal C outbreak in our local area and we know that we're going to have an increased inflow of patients. Many of these will be well children that we will be able to send home but among them there's going to be a number that are going to be seriously unwell and potentially deteriorating in the department so when we come to plan for this we're going to need to think about ways to triage people quickly so we can pick out who is sick and also ways that we're going to be reassessing patients in the waiting room while they're waiting to be seen so we can detect any deteriorating patients so if we bring these two examples back in and think about our upcoming respiratory surge then we can see that there's some similarities and some differences unlike like in the meningococcal C example, we're not going to have huge numbers of patients deteriorating acutely in our ED. There may be the occasional one or two, but that's not going to be the pattern. But we're going to have a problem of lots of patients who are relatively well and could potentially go home coming into the ED. And we're going to have to find a way to be able to triage them, send them home appropriately, even though some of them will have respiratory distress, in order to help manage the flow in our department. Because if we don't manage that inflow, it's going to lead to problems of increased acuity, outflow problems and crowding. So let's take a look at these four areas of flow. Thinking about inflow and how to manage it is a core principle of managing flow in the department. One thing we might consider is times that patients will present. So it's possible that around the time after parents have come back from work, we're going to see a bigger inflow then because they'll have a look at their children, they'll be more worried about them and might bring them in. Now this might be changed because of the pandemic and there's more people working from home but it's worth thinking about what your busiest times are likely to be because then we can change the departmental staffing accordingly. We know we're going to have a higher volume of patients coming in so thinking about how to triage them quickly, maybe putting more, more clinicians on the front to try and get your triage time within 15 minutes although it may not be possible to triage everyone within 15 minutes if there's huge inflow. So then we have to start thinking about well how are we going to differentiate them and decide who to prioritise in triage. This is really tricky because most of us will already have an age priority, so maybe we prioritise those who are under ones, they'll get triaged more quickly. But in this respiratory surge, we're going to have mainly under ones, so we have to find different ways of differentiating them. And we've been trying to think about what the best ways are to do this. One way to do it is to close down the age period even more, so to say, well, actually, we're going to prioritise those who are under three months old and see them more quickly. Or we could look at comorbidities, so if the baby's ex prem or has other risk factors, then we might see them more quickly. Or we could do it on worker breathing, although that might be a bit tricky to establish before triage whether you're more worried about a, a patient clinically. We need to think what suits our department and our population but it's likely we're going to have to add a bit of nuance to our current triage plans because we're going to have a large volume of very young patients and we need to work out how to see them more quickly. Acuity is a really important part of 
managing patient flow as well. So how are we going to decide who are the sickest patients? So respiratory distress is probably a good one, but then we need to think about, well, how are we going to stratify these? Is it SATs? Is it those with SATs below 92% that we're going to be more worried about? Is it work of breathing? Maybe it's those babies who are having apneas that we would be more worried about in this category. So we need to think, how are we going to decide in our department what makes a patient higher acuity? The other thing that we could consider with acuity is going to be timing. And this is where it gets trickier with bronchiolitis because you might have a, a baby who is currently day two and therefore we're more worried that their acuity is going to be higher in the next 12 hours. And this may be a factor when we think about how to assess acuity. What is the timing of the illness and will that affect whether we admit them or whether we can send them home. I think we all know that acuity is probably not likely to be the biggest problem in the respiratory surge, at least at the beginning, but it will become a problem later on as inflow increases and outflow starts to become an issue. We're going to end up admitting a lot of patients who do actually need to be in hospital, so they might need NG feeds or IV fluids or they might need oxygen, and so they are going to have to be admitted. And over time, the ward's going to fill up the PICU is going to fill up and therefore their HDU capacity is going to fill up. That's going to mean that we have more and more patients spending longer in our PETS EDs. This is going to cause problems because it's going to take away from medical and nursing staffing looking after these patients and that is going to impact on the broader issue of flow and inflow and assessment in our departments. And this is where we really need to start thinking about outflow and how we're going to plan this now with our colleagues because it's not just about us and PTD, this is going to be something that we need to work with our ward colleagues and PICU colleagues to try and come up with a plan that works for the whole hospital. And we, we need to do this before the respiratory surge starts and before we're in a situation where outflow is a problem. RED can't be the holding chamber for all risk in the hospital. We need to start planning with our ward colleagues for what the escalation process will be when we have a flow problem. Because we know that on the wards they'll have a certain nurse to patient ratio and we may find that patients can't move to the ward because there's an issue with that ratio on the ward. And that's okay until it becomes a problem in ED. So if we're getting 10 to 20 patients an hour into ED and we're not getting patients moving to the rest of the hospital, then there's going to be increasing risk in ED. This is where we need to work together to plan. It's very difficult to do this in real time, but it may be just around facilitating discharges, thinking about planning ahead, thinking about how we can move things around in the wards to accommodate patients. There isn't a clear answer to this. I don't have the answer, but it's better for us to start planning this now so that we know that we have to prioritise outflow in ED alongside our colleagues on the wards. And then the second thing for us in ED is to think about what happens when we don't have outflow. So we really can't move things around more in the hospital. There's no more patients going home. And so we have to manage with the increasing number of patients in ED and this is going to be about thinking how can we reconfigure our EDs is there things that we could move around so we could have more patients together in spaces? Is there ways to open up cubicles? This is all really complicated by the fact that because of COVID, we've likely been building more cubicles. There may not be a simple answer, but it's worthwhile thinking now, is there anything we could change around an RED so that when there's an issue that we don't have any outflow happening to the rest of the hospital, that we could optimize things in RED. So if we go back to our BMX championship race that's happening up the road. When we think about that, outflow is less likely to be an issue because most patients aren't going to be admitted. There will be some that are coming in for theatre, but actually most of them will be being sorted by us and being discharged. And that's fine. That's where we have to bear the brunt of the issue in ED and that's what we do best. So that's fine. But that's not going to be the same in the respiratory surge. It's going to be an outflow problem where patients are backing up in PZD for all of the reasons we've discussed. And that's where crowding starts to happen. So we need to think about how to manage crowding in our ED. What we're going to have is an increasing number of patients and therefore an increasing number of sick patients in our ED. And it's important to think about how we can mitigate that risk of crowding. This is where we need to get out our escalation plans because we probably had escalation plans which may have been put on the back burner or changed because of COVID. So it's time to dig them out and go through them again 
again and make sure we're all on the same page throughout the whole hospital, not just in the ED. One thing we might do to help with the problem of crowding is doing RSV near patient testing. And I think this is a really tricky issue and it's something that we need to apply to our own departments and our own situations. Because if we can test patients and we find out that they've got RSV, then we then need to do something with that information. And we know that actually RSV is really clinically assessed and clinically diagnosed. So we know the patient's got a respiratory problem. The question is, will knowing that they've got RSV help us or hinder us in being able to speed the process of flow? If you look at the RCPCH guidelines, what they're advising us to do is essentially separate those who've got COVID from those who've got other respiratory illnesses. And actually in their algorithm, it doesn't make much difference whether they've got RSV or another respiratory virus or no respiratory virus. Actually, what we care about is COVID or not COVID. So it's not necessary that we have to cohort all the RSV patients together. It's more that we have to cohort non-COVID patients together rather than mixing in COVID and worsening the issues of the pandemic. And so the decision here is gonna be about what is best for flow in your department. So if testing them for RSV means that you'll be able to speed them up to a cohort bay, then that is wonderful and we should totally be doing that. But it's also possible that finding out they've got RSV is going to slow their progress into the hospital because there isn't a space in a cohort bay. It may be then that that patient with RSV ends up staying for 12 hours in our ED because there isn't a space for them. Near patient testing for RSV isn't going to change what we do on the management clinically of the patient because that's going to be based on our assessment and their observations and so on but it will change the flow. We need to make sure that our RSV near testing policy actually benefits our situation in the hospital as a whole and make sure that we are using it to expedite flow rather than slow it down. Staff wellbeing is such an important issue. We have had a difficult 18 months. Some of that is because people have been redeployed and helping in other places. Some of it might even be guilt about being in peds rather than being able to help on the adult side. But everyone's been a, been a affected whether professionally personally it has been a long old 18 months and to go into another respiratory surge puts a lot of strain on all of us we need to try and support our staff as best we can finding the best resources the best way to support them is not easy we want to do something meaningful and not something that is superficial or just as a tick box one thing that we have definitely noticed and that i've noticed is that positive feedback systems like Gratex or simply acknowledging and thanking people really does make a difference, even though it seems like a very superficial thing. There is nothing quite like the feeling of being thanked or actually being able to formally thank someone else. So it's important that we try to reinforce these within our department. There's a load of wellbeing resources available online. It's worth sifting through and finding which resonate with you most and which you think will be most impactful on the team. And the other thing is, can we go out with our team now? We've all been doing everything remotely for so long and we have a window, I don't know how long it'll last, but there is a window for doing something with our team before the respiratory surge starts. So can you actually do a team activity now, even if it's just going out for a drink or something, to try and reconnect and have some time outside of work where we can talk to each other and try to connect and understand each other. This is gonna make a huge difference for the team and how we're gonna get on over the next year. I think it's important to mention interpersonal relationships within the hospital here. I know it's a sensitive issue. Every hospital has personalities that clash, have long-standing disputes or disagreements and tensions and we tend to have them unspoken. As we're starting to plan for the respiratory surge, now is the time to actually tackle them and deal with them head on because we need to make sure that our interpersonal disputes are not going to affect issues around flow in the department, especially when we're all getting stressed and when the flow is getting higher. Time to stop brushing these issues under the table. If there's a burning issue that has been swept under the carpet, it's time to take it out and actually address it. And that might be quite corridor conversations. It might be at the level of your managers. Anything that is going to hamper escalation and flow is better to be aired now. So we're expecting an upcoming respiratory surge, but we're also in the middle of the COVID pandemic. And how do we balance these two things? When we see respiratory kids, how worried are we about whether they've got RSV or COVID? The answer 
is that clinically it doesn't really make a huge amount of difference because in ED we're going to be assessing them the same, we're going to look at them, know they've got a respiratory problem and then decide do they need to come in or not and that's not going to be based on what is causing the respiratory illness, which virus is going to be based on our assessment of the respiratory effort, the feeding, all of the other things that we've discussed. Where COVID comes into it is that we need to stop spreading COVID and so we test them when they come into hospital so that we don't then put them in a situation where they are spreading COVID to other patients or getting COVID from other patients. That's where the COVID distinction comes in. But other than that, it doesn't make any difference clinically to our assessment in ED. But it does pose a question about whether we're going to be seeing more PIMS-TS in young patients. Are we going to be seeing a surge in PIMS-TS? Are we going to be seeing them in younger patients because the respiratory surge is likely to affect younger patients? If you're hoping that I'm going to provide the answer in this video, I'm sorry, I'm not. I wish I had it. I think we just need to see and be open to the possibility that we might be seeing increasing numbers of PIMS-TS, but we don't have any evidence to support that this is what's happening or what's going to happen. Ultimately, if we see a patient with a respiratory problem who's very young and very sick, it's much more likely that they've got RSV, sepsis rather than having COVID. We've got a challenge in PEDS ED for the respiratory surge ahead, but by thinking about this now, by planning, by thinking about all the components of flow and how we can optimise things in a way that suits our department, there's not going to be one size fits all and also looking after our staff and the relationships we have with our staff, that's how we're going to be best prepared for planning and coping with the respiratory surge.